Well, good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I think we have a really exceptional group here to talk about what is clearly a salient topic for, for everyone in the United States, and that is whether the United States can rebuild a national security consensus. There are really three propositions that underpin the discussion that we're going to have here today. The first is the proposition that the United States is at some kind of crossroads in its foreign policy. That proposition is that the nation is fiscally challenged, we're politically polarized, we're frustrated by more than 10 years of conflict, and we're confronting in the geopolitical sense a relative rise in, of uh, other actors and thus a relative decline of the United States. <coughs> Secretary Hagel just this morning, for those who were able to listen, laid out a really dawning set of international challenges that combine with this domestic context to put us at this crossroads. Securing U.S. interests in this landscape, domestic and international landscape, uh, is going to be difficult. We'll have to successfully navigate a lot of challenges. So the second proposition of the panel is that we don't today know exactly how we want to do that as a nation. There is no clear consensus on the basic parameters of U.S. foreign policy. The Pew Foundation, among others, um, have done some recent polling in this area. In 2012, they indicated through their polling that there's a general agreement on the desirability among respondents of the U.S. having an active role in the world. Yet, a consensus about what exactly it means to have an active role in the world is much less clear. And in fact, about the same proportion, about 83% of respondents also recommended that the United States put more focus on the troubles at home, problems at home. So the prospect of US military intervention in Syria and the prospect of how the US would respond to the use of chemical weapons really, I think, recently highlighted this sense of fragility about our national security consensus, where it wasn't clear for a bit there exactly where the American public stood, where different parts of the Washington establishment stood, indeed, where our allies stood. So the third proposition of this panel is that a consensus matters. When the nation is deeply fragmented, we're prone to strategic drift, and we've seen that before, certainly during the Vietnam War era. A shared vision of U.S. national security allows us to be agile, and it allows us to be purposeful. The contrast might be where the United States was at the end of World War II, where a consensus was formed and was very useful to the United States. The U.S. foreign policy consensus is also important to our allies and our partners who look for us to be predictable, to understand where we want to go in the world. And it, of course, would help deter those who would otherwise question the US and its motives. To discuss these three propositions and the state, the general state of the US national security consensus, I'm joined today by three really fantastic panelists. First, to my immediate left, Dr. Mitchell Reese is the president of Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland. He previously served as the Dean of International Relations and a Professor of Law at the College of William & Mary. His government service includes uh, time working as the Special Assistant to the National Security Advisor and as a consultant to the State Department, among others. He is an accomplished uh, and a writer, an author, and a frequent commentator on international security and arms control issues. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Reese. Uh, Ms. Julianne Smith is to his left. Julianne served until this summer as the Deputy National Security Advisor to Vice President Biden. In this position, she played a key role in helping to shape U.S. foreign and national security policy across the breadth of timely issues that are likely to arise today. She has also served in the Defense Department as the Principal Director for European and NATO Policy. And prior to joining the Obama administration, Julie directed the CSIS Europe program and the initiative for a renewed transatlantic relationship, partnership, excuse me. And finally, uh, all the way on the end there is David Ignatius, and he will be known, I'm sure, to many of you here in the audience. Mr. Ignatius writes a, a twice a week foreign affairs column for the Washington Post. He also contributes to the Post Partisan 
blog for the Washington Post, and he has written eight spy novels. He has previously served as executive editor of the International Herald Tribune and as a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Thank you for being here today. So let me start with a question to each of you in turn, starting with Dr. Reese. And that is to think a little bit about these three propositions that I've put forward. What is the state of our consensus? Do we have a domestic consensus about the role of the United States in the world? Or do we even need one? So let me start with you, Dr. Reese. Great. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here today. And uh, let me congratulate CSIS on this beautiful new home for itself, which I understand is fully paid for. <laughs> so as a college president, that's really important. Um, I, uh, I actually think that there are a number of issues around um, which the American people do agree, that there is uh, consensus around certain uh, foreign policy issues that sometimes get overlooked. Uh, at the end of September, a bipartisan polling group up in New York uh, undertook a poll of the American people, and it asked them uh, about certain threats and perceptions of the world. And some of the uh, results are um, uh, perhaps not surprising, but it's important to, to remember. Uh, the American people gave high marks to Iran, China, and North Korea as threats to the United States. Nine out of ten Americans thought the world would be much more dangerous if Iran would get nuclear weapons. Four to five Americans believed that we should focus on protecting national interests here at home, uh, as was said, versus expanding democracy abroad. Um, that's quite a change from uh, previous administrations, I think. 78% uh, of Americans uh, said that they did not trust uh, Mr. Putin. And a majority said that the world is less safe today than it was five years ago, about 57%. So there are some things around which the American people agree. The challenge, and frankly the challenge that the leadership in Washington has not risen to, is to try to shape some of these independent issues around a foreign policy strategy. Uh, whether it be towards our allies, to our adversaries, and then being able to articulate it and being able to sell it to the American people. And I think that there are some real shortcomings, both in the articulation and in the messaging. Uh, uh, obviously, if you don't have a foreign policy strategy, you can't articulate it. But I think that there's uh, problems twofold, that uh, the articulation and the messaging. Consequently, the American people uh, don't understand or not as well informed as they need to be about some of the threats we face around the world. Very good. Um, well, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's nice to be back at CSIS, back in the new building, uh, and see so many familiar friends and, and faces. Um, on, the, on the consensus question, whether or not there's a consensus uh, in the United States right now on foreign policy, I have a similar answer to what Mitchell just outlined, it's a little bit of a yes and no answer. Um, in some ways, we do have a consensus, particularly on the use of military force. I think in the run-up to the vote on Syria, we could see the American public's hesitation and caution against getting engaged in another military intervention. I think we could see fairly high levels of support for the way in which the U.S. got involved in Libya, and that is to say the U.S. took a supporting role. It was only in the lead in the first few days of that operation, and I think most Americans were quite comfortable with that, handing the baton over to someone else to really take the lead. And I think this idea that the United States, particularly on the military side, doesn't always need to be at the front is one that is increasingly uh, of great appeal to a lot of Americans. We're fatigued from over 10 plus years of being in Iraq and Afghanistan. Our military is fatigued. We've seen the results of a long-term commitment there. There's some skepticism about the ability to rebuild an entire country like Afghanistan and the limits. We've seen the limits of U.S. military power. But on the flip side of things, I think there are a lot of open-ended questions that doesn't necessary, that don't necessarily lead us to a consensus. On technology in particular, it feels like we're in the Wild West. There are all sorts of different views across the American landscape, whether you're talking about academia or think tanks or government, about the best way to utilize technology, whether you're talking about cyber or space or now Intel. This whole frontier 
feel so new to us. And it's triggering a lot of deep-rooted questions about the way in which we utilize these new tools. Uh, and from there, there are, just, there are also open-ended questions about regions, lots of questions about the rebalancing to Asia, what's the grand strategy, as you noted, for the Middle East, what's the relationship we have now with our partners in Europe, where do we go from here in a resource-constrained environment. So plenty of open-ended questions, but I think on that military piece, I do see some consensus there uh, on, that, on that side of things. Very good. David, that's quite a change, if you will, from sort of the, the sense of the U.S. being the global leader um, out in front. Where do you see uh, the issue of consensus and the U.S. role in the world from the American public's perspective? First, uh, I want to say it's great to be in what I want to call the house that John built. <laughs> um, this is a magnificent new headquarters for a great institution, and I know friends of CSIS are really happy to be here and see how, how wonderful it is. Um, I think I basically agree with, with Julie that um, to the extent there's a consensus in the country, we are a country after uh, Iraq and Afghanistan that is uh, weary of war, yes, uh, especially our military has been fighting hard and, uh, and, and, and does not want to be uh, used in, in missions that, uh, about which it thinks there's not adequate clarity. And we're wary of, of war, we're wary of involvement in, in projects that aren't, aren't well ex explained. Um, I, I saw that consensus most uh, clearly um, in its first phase uh, during the 2012 presidential campaign. I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody that uh, it became so obvious in the debate about using military force in Syria. If you remember the, the, the campaign, early in the campaign, Mitt Romney had a very uh, tough, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, almost interventionist, traditionally interventionist. Um, kind of, of, of rhetoric, talking about kind of staying the course in Afghanistan, uh, talking in very t tough terms about Iran and willingness to use military power against Iran, really stress on that as opposed to negotiations. By the last debate of the campaign, which was the foreign policy debate, what was striking to me as an observer um, was that the, the, the two candidates' positions on major issues had become almost identical. There really wasn't a lot of space between where Mitt Romney was and where President Obama was in that last debate. And I think that tells you that uh, Mitt Romney, is a, as a you know, candidate who was listening to his advisors and reading where the country was, saw that you, know, you, you had to, to, to be careful with a country that, that was that, uh, that concerned. So if you have a consensus about what you're not going to do, uh, that's a pretty frail consensus. Yeah, and I think that we've seen um, how problematic that is over the last few months. I mean, you say there's a consensus, but when you have a situation where the Secretary of State twice in one week basically says that we are going to use military power in Syria to, to enforce uh, global norms against use of chemical weapons, uh, and then you have the President decide that no, he's not going to use military force because he first wants to go to Congress, um, you know, that, that tells you that even within the administration, let alone a broader uh, uh, context, there is, there is not yet a clear consensus. So the lesson of that, I think, among other things, is don't get out ahead of the president. Um, you know, if, if the president isn't, isn't really on board with the policy, the Secretary of State has to be careful about uh, enunciating it quite as, as, as hard strongly as he did. So we'll talk more about these issues. I'd love, uh, Kath, to just say a little bit about what I think is happening on the ground now in mm -hmm. Syria uh, based on recent reporting. Mm -hmm. But I'd say there's a negative consensus. Well, let's not do that. Mm -hmm. But there isn't a positive consensus that will help policymakers figure out where they do want to go. Well, let's pick up on a, a, a couple themes here. Um, turning to Mitchell, the, the example of Syria combined with your point about Americans being concerned, united, at least a large majority, united on views on Iran, Iran and North Korea, among other issues. Where then do you think a positive agenda could be built with Syria, you know, not even in our, in our tail lights, but the, certainly the, the salient experience of the U.S. intervention issue, um, having 
you know, pass through this consensus issue, where do you think we go on areas like Iran and North Korea where there's more of a, of a, a sense that the U.S. might have a positive agenda? You know, in a, in a previous life, I was an attorney, and there was a saying that uh, tough cases make bad law. <laughs> And uh, I'm not sure that you want to extrapolate any um, universal field theories uh, from the Syria case. Uh, I think that we had more options two years ago uh, to, uh, to do certain things there. I think that we had more options a year ago. Uh, as I see it now, I think uh, one of the main lessons is one of triage. Um, more concerned um, for our allies in the region, uh, maintaining uh, King Abdullah in Jordan in particular, uh, these may be more doable than uh, really changing the battlefield um, in Syria itself. I think David can speak with, with greater authority than I can. If you look at Syria within a broader context of interventions over the last couple of decades, uh, where have we intervened uh, around the world, and particularly in the, in the Middle East, and where have those interventions been successful? And the reality is uh, there aren't any uh, home runs. Uh, in this thing. Some of them have been messy, some of them um, have deteriorated to the status quo ante. Uh, I think if there's one lesson to take from the interventions that have been successful, is that there has to be a consensus going in that you're going to stick around, uh, not just for a few years, but for decades. And we see this in the Balkans, where the Europeans have stood up a force that has been there now for a long, long time. And uh, again, each one of these is sui generis, but it does seem that there is a, a question of stamina. And you have to be able to understand that going in. Are we willing to do what is necessary in Syria for the next few decades to stabilize the situation? And I think uh, you know, the consensus is the American people aren't behind that. And it begs the question of whether they could be persuaded with, with stronger leadership from the White House. Uh, but right now, that's not forthcoming. And so I think that um, uh, we're not going to see that type of intervention in Syria. Uh, saving those we can may be the best we can do under the circumstance. Uh, and um, uh, I think if that's, that may be David's negative consensus, it's hard to see a positive consensus when we're talking about military intervention right now. So, uh, Julie, going to your point, I think you were the first to raise this idea that there is a consensus around not wanting to be out in front. What does this mean then for places like Iran? What's the takeaway for U.S. policy toward Iran? Um, well on use of force? Well, it's, it's varied. I mean, we have the very, particularly in Congress, we have very hawkish voices uh, that have pushed for us to continue to rattle that option uh, and keep it on the table and march towards that potential outcome should we not find that the negotiations are producing the desired outcome. Uh, that we all imagine. But now that we've encountered this new window uh, that has come with the new leadership inside Iran, it's been fascinating to watch this debate. You still have some folks that want us to continue down that path and stand firm and not take anything off the table. Um, others are now not necessarily going down that path, but pushing sanctions uh, and another round of sanctions in Congress. And then the administration is trying to say, look, everything remains on the table, but we've got to give this a chance. Personally, I think this is the biggest opening and window we've had in a long time, and that it would be just tragic if we didn't give this a go. I don't, I'm not wearing rose-colored glasses. I'm not going to assume that this is going to produce the intended outcome and result in us truly halting uh, their nuclear ambitions, but we've got to give it a chance. And I think by taking this maximalist approach as some have done, kind of it's all or nothing, they have to meet this huge list of criteria, or we've got to walk away. It's really potentially shutting the door to this last window of negotiations and then marching us towards an intervention that, as we noted, most Americans wouldn't support, I, I'm guessing, and wouldn't want us necessarily to go down that path. So it's been extremely complicated, particularly managing this on the Hill, where you've got lots of different voices, a tremendous array of views. We can't neglect the fact that our friends in Israel have strong views on this as well and are clearly, you know, working with friends here in town to contribute to the debate. It's, it's a Rubik's Cube that's going to be a tremendous challenge uh, to sort out in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, but I, I completely support the administration's position. If, if we don't seize on this window, it may be the last window we have. And let's think about the consequences of closing that window. 
So David, sometimes you can have a grand strategy that everyone buys into, and sometimes you can infer a strategy. <laughs> um, and particularly foreign leaders, I'm sure, spend time trying to infer what our strategy is. Um, you know, based on, based on the, the, how we have reacted most recently in Syria, based on the sense of where the U.S. is going in terms of its internal um, political turmoil, if you will, what is your sense um, of what particularly Middle East leaders think the U.S. strategy holds for them in the future? Well, th that particular um, subset uh, would probably answer disaster. I mean, you know, the, I, I've rarely seen uh, leaders across, um, uh, across the, the Arab world um, so uh, worried about where the U.S. is, is heading, so uh, feeling uh, ignored and uh, so vulnerable. I think Secretary Kerry's uh, visit to Egypt and Saudi Arabia um, helped at that. Um, you know, I think to some extent this is a self-inflicted wound, a part of uh, effective policy making, especially in times of, of transition like this, is to communicate all the time with both allies and adversaries, and that, and that wasn't uh, done adequately uh, around Syria, and they're now scrambling to, um, to make up the lost ground, and, and Secretary Kerry on this, as I must say, on many other things, um, has, has, has been a good representative for the United States. Just to briefly uh, respond to your implicit question, what is the, what should people think our, our grand strategy is? Um, the, the right place to start is to read carefully the President's speech to the UN General Assembly. It was written to be a basic strategic framing document for the rest of his presidency, very self-consciously as that. And he said explicitly, there are four things that we're prepared to go to war over. Uh, interestingly, each of them really speaks to Saudi security interests, which the Saudis, I think, kind of missed. But the, those four things are the, the free flow of, of energy from the, from the Gulf and around the world. That's interesting at a time when we have less need for foreign oil. We're, we're still saying that's something we're going to go to war for. Uh, the second is to protect our allies and basic alliances. The third is to uh, fight terrorist networks that threaten the United States and our friends and allies, basic CT mission. And the fourth is to deal with uh, WMD proliferation, which puts special focus on Iran and the Iranian nuclear program. So that's an agenda that you'd think, if people read carefully, they would have said that, that <coughs> that's, that's pretty much a Saudi Gulf wish list of what U.S. policy should be. Because the policies are so divergent on Syria, and again, we can come back to that, uh, there was great unhappiness. Um, you know, nothing is forever anywhere in the Middle, uh, Middle East, and, and so I, I think the Kerry trip, um, you know, the, the, just the body language, the tone is, is, is quite different from what it was uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. I'm leaving this afternoon for Egypt, so talk to me in two weeks and I'll tell you <laughs> what I really think. Can I, can I, can I, David, can I just um, sort of engage a little bit on that? So one of the notable things that wasn't part of those four principles was support for human rights and democracy protection. Okay, completely since the Cairo speech, mm -hmm. It has been absent without leave in this administration, and clearly they don't have any plans for the future. Just put that aside for a second, but I think that's worth noting. The second thing is if the president gives a speech at the UN and it still does not address the concern that the leaders in the Middle East have, it speaks to the president's credibility. It speaks to America's resoluteness. It speaks to our ability to support our allies and friends around the world. And here's where I think the Syria issue really did great damage, greater than whatever the specific policy decision was. It sort of lifted the veil on some strategic confusion uh, at the very highest levels in the United States. And if you are uh, a small country in a dangerous neighborhood, that has to be worrisome. Because but for the United States, uh, it's a very, very difficult world for you. And it means that you are either going to have to uh, independently come to your own defense, proliferate, in the case of Saudi Arabia or perhaps some others, or you're going to start hedging your bets and bandwagging with the Iranians. 
And we've already seen a little bit of both behavior uh, over the past few years. But I think this is really where the problem is. The administration not only doesn't have a strategy, but there's a lack of credibility. And again, if you want to get to the, the, the re-pivot to Asia, it's not that this is a bad idea. I think that uh, as a member of the, a veteran of the Bush administration, I think that we can claim that we had some role to play in this also. It's the lack of resources to adequately uh, fund what that pivot means. And the people in Asia aren't stupid. They understand the budget difficulties that we have. They can understand when Secretary of Defense Panetta says that the budget cuts are going to be devastating. And then they take place. And then there's a sequester on top of that. So again, it has to do with where we are at this particular time and the administration's inability to be, uh, articulate a clear policy and then have people believe it. And so I think it's more than just beyond the, the details of the policy or the strategy itself. Julie, the administration I, versus the, the, the is how much of this is about leadership? Right. How much of it is about underlying conditions? Where do you yeah. think this falls Well, I, I think Mitchell's right. I mean, the, the mood uh, just around the, the globe is uh, gloomy towards the United States. Uh, and I think it depends on what region you're talking about. Some of it is rooted in our actual policies. And I think for the Middle East, you can point to Syria. But I think in other corners of the world, uh, particularly if you look at Europe and Asia, the, the gloomy mood right now is stemming a lot from our dysfunction at home. And I think I've, I've recently been on both in Asia and Europe over the last six or seven weeks. And I was struck. I mean, I happened to be there during the shutdown, which was unfortunate. But I, the tr real deep-rooted questions and suspicions about the future of US leadership, about diminishing resources to dedicate to US foreign policy, the extent to which we're going to be able to be there to support allies. And this is a common thread now that is really picked up in most capitals around the globe. Questions about the lack of bipartisanship, the role of Congress, whether or not we can continue to have this debate over the debt ceiling uh, that goes on and on and on and sees no end. So yes, part of it is rooted in policy. I think a lot of it's rooted in our domestic dysfunction here in Washington. Washington. David, any thoughts on well, the I, domestic you, <laughs> state of affairs? Um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a mess, and it's a, <laughs> it's a demonstration for the world that uh, the country that calls itself exceptional and wants to be a global leader uh, has a political system that's verging on breakdown. And that is a, that is a national security crisis of the first order, and it just must be addressed. People need to take this much more seriously. And I, I hope all of the political groups, especially the business groups that can address why things are breaking down, will, 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 will do so. Um, just to address um, Mitchell's good point about democracy promotion being left off the <coughs> list of the things the United States will go to war for. Um, <coughs> I think the president was reading the country pretty accurately in saying um, we're going to be more careful about that. And I think, you know, if there's anything that we've all learned, it's it's that um, America, you know, with what were good intentions uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the, the, the efficacy of our military power to produce outcomes that we desire and that I would say, as an observer, are good outcomes for the people, is limited. And the world has watched that, and the world has seen, as Americans have seen, the limits of our power. To be blunt, the world thinks that we've been defeated. Uh, that they think that we, that we failed in Iraq, and we are failing in Afghanistan. And I think Syria is added, layered on that, as another example of, of American failure, of an American fecklessness, inability to achieve the outcomes that we seek. You know, I, when this all began back in 2003, one of my close Arab friends said to me, I said, what, what do you think about this? He said, when, when Rome is strong, the provinces are robust. <laughs> Meaning, if you make it work, we're all for it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in the end, as we've all seen, we, we didn't make it work. Uh, just briefly to share a, a vignette, I spoke this morning with one of my uh, closest uh, sources in the Free Syrian Army. Uh, and we were talking about a man with whom I traveled a year ago to the outskirts of Aleppo. I went into Aleppo, but his headquarters were 
to the northeast of the city. His name is Colonel Abdul Jabbar Akedi. And he has, was a principal US uh, contact in the period when we were trying to uh, train, assist, in a limited way, arm the Syrian rebels. As you may have seen in the, the Washington Post yesterday, he just quit. And he quit because he felt that he had been abandoned and that he and his people were at risk from the more extreme militias. And so he was basically running for cover. The man we have celebrated as the great moderate hope, General Salim Idris, is in a, a, just doesn't know what to do, feeling that he has been abandoned by the people who told him, principally the Americans, that we would stand with him as he told his friends, neighbors, country people to uh, fight in this fight against the Assad regime. Uh, so I think you can't do this. You can't draw people into a fight, tell them you're going to be with them, and then walk away without real consequences. And frankly, we're just beginning to see the consequences. I, you know, the Al Qaeda is putting down deep roots in northeast Syria. And as your Iraqis would tell you last week when they were visiting, that they are matched by increasingly deep roots in western Iraq. Uh, some very serious action is going to have to be taken to get them out of there. They're at the gates of Europe. Uh, you know, there have been thousands now of foreign fighters streaming through Syria. Mm -hmm. So I just note this, I, not to be, to be gloomy, but I just want to give you a snapshot of what this feels like for real people who've been involved in this fight at our encouragement. I'm going to come back to Syria. <clears throat> I, I'm not actually leaving Syria, but, <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm going to leave that direct point um, and ask about the institutions that the United States led, international institutions led in building after World War II. And Syria certainly is relevant here, the UN, NATO, um, economic institutions. Mitchell, what's your view of how strong these institutions are, whether they can be agile enough to adapt to the new circumstances we've discussed, or whether new institutions are needed for a new US consensus? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just use so the UN. Yeah. You know, the UN in Syria, um, I, you know, I, I suppose there could be a debate about how useful it's been. You know, when I was in the government, um, <laughs> people would, would come uh, to me with lots of uh, really interesting ideas about forming a new international organization uh, or no coalition. <laughs> and um, I have to say, if you're in the government, this is not really welcome news because um, <laughs> uh, sort of staffing and supporting all these institutions already consumes so much time. And it's unclear that a new alignment uh, is really going to make a difference. Um, and. And so the, the question, I think, really is how can you make these institutions more effective? And relevant. Are, and, they, are and relevant. they relevant? And, and uh, well, I think clearly they are. The problem is, and, and Julian touched on it, with technology and with the diffusion of power throughout the world now, um, I, I think it's just more difficult to, to build a consensus in the first place and then uh, empower somebody to actually do something. Um, I think Moise's name just wrote uh, a very mm -hmm. interesting book uh, which talks about this trend. So uh, again, a lot of it comes back to what is Washington's favorite parlor game, which is talking about leadership, either too much of it or a lack of it. Um, uh, do we have uh, a clear idea of what we want? You know, and it's not clear to me that we do. Uh, we know what we don't want. I think that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, the American people want to rebuild the economy. They want Washington to work. Um, uh, I was just in the Middle East recently, and I, I told uh, my audience that, that most Americans see the Middle East as a hostile, complicated, and confusing place that no matter what the United States does, we're going to be blamed for it. Uh, if we intervene, we're going to be blamed. If we don't intervene, we're going to be blamed. And therefore, we're just going to let people get on with it themselves. And I think that that is the national mood. Uh, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make it easy to come up with, with uh, a, a clear plan for the way ahead. If I can just say that, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, the, the, the bumper sticker in Washington was smart power. And um, I have to say, I've never understood the boomlet uh, behind smart power because uh, at, its, at its best, 
it is a means to a larger foreign policy goal. At its worst, it is, it is a slogan. Um, we need some serious thinking about what it is we want. And perhaps, um, to pick up the previous point, it, it doesn't have to be a global policy. I think the regions are so significantly different that an Asia policy that's coherent would be welcome, uh, a Middle East policy, a European or an alliance policy. Uh, that may be the best you can do. I mean, I, I am a kind of a, a guy who thinks strategy is important and planning is important. Um, how you link them all together, you go and you come up with our values. I think that's one way to do it. Uh, but the world is so different, it's going at different speeds, that uh, I think you have to be a little differentiated in your approach. But you have to have an approach. And I just don't see this administration having any clue as to what it really wants to accomplish in foreign policy or being able to assign the resources to be able to accomplish those goals. So, Julie, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you, you uh, obviously welcome to comment on uh, Mitchell's points, but also ask you the institution question, because I do think it's important. What, what are the viability of these institutions to help the U.S. or help common interests, given that the U.S. isn't looking to be out in front on use of force issues, at least, except where our direct interests are concerned? Well, the collection or the alphabet soup of international organizations that we helped create and continue to play a leadership role in, they're all important. And I'm not going to stand here and tell anyone that we should abandon any of these institutions uh, or lose faith in them. But they're dated. They're rusty. They're creaky. Uh, they're struggling to adapt to an entirely different set of, of players, uh, a very transformative moment in, in foreign policy writ large. And they're particularly challenged with the resource constraints that all of us are facing. NATO, just to cite one example, is extremely useful. You know, 60 plus years of experience working together in all sorts of places, undertaking missions together, working on interoperability, the legitimacy it provides to missions abroad. But it's all under attack by the fact that we're now seeing severe cuts to defense budgets among all the member states, large, small, medium. And so that's an open-end question, but I wouldn't suggest that, again, we walk away. But they're going to take take a lot of work in the years ahead to make them more functional, more effective, and figure out ways to do more with less. The one point I would add, and you know, I'd hate to suggest that we form anything new, particularly having been in, in the administration, remembering these conversations and rolling your eyes and thinking, oh my gosh, what is this going to mean for us um, in terms of management? But I'm not exactly sure that the set of institutions that we have right now can cope with challenges like cyber, mm -hmm. like space. Um, I'm, I'm wondering right now if the US wants to come out of this low point uh, and boost our leadership and build public trust, build our national trust, to me, it seems like we need to immediately start to take a leadership role, let's just take cyber, on establishing international norms, um, working with our partners to get codes of conduct settled, to try and find ways in which we can tackle this problem together, whether you're talking about uh, you know, denial of service all the way up to a malicious malware attack. So in the case of cyber, I'm not sure it's a NATO issue. I'm not sure it's an EU-US issue. I'm not sure that's, that spans the globe. It's not a UN issue. Um, uh, so the question then is, do we need some sort of new institution or forum or setting where we can then lead the way, help set standards, the international norms that we need, uh, and in a framework and in an environment where you know, like-minded partners and allies can come together to get the work done? Great. I'm going to, starting with David, go around and, and ask a question, and then we're going to turn it over. We've left a good amount of time, uh, and we've certainly given you a broad array of issues to ask questions on. But starting with David, based on this conversation today, based on all the thinking you've done on this issue, what are really some pillars that, that constitute the beginning of a consensus on foreign policy? And maybe you want to start with the President's speech. Do you think, uh, with respect to the Middle East, do you think those are pillars that can be agreed upon and built upon, and are there others that you would add? Well, I, I think that um, 
uh, Mitch said it well, um, national power has to rest on solid foundations. Um, presidents get in trouble when they embark on um, ventures for which there isn't adequate public support and then uh, patience wears out, the country gets tired and uh, these uh, efforts um, run into trouble. So, uh, you know, we are going to be in a period where properly we're, we're going to be careful. We have a world in great turmoil where it's very difficult to predict where it's going to end up. Um, in any event, it's going to take a while for it to get where it's going to end up. So I think, you know, a prudent, a careful policy, and that's something that, you know, as people identify with President Obama, lot, lots to be said for that. Um, you know, when, they, when you're in, I, when I taught at Harvard, I spoke about the fog of policy. It's like the fog of war. You don't know where you are. You don't know where other people are. And then when you're in the fog, you don't, don't know where the shoals are. A lot to be said for running the engine a little slower. You know, don't just slam it ahead um, because, you know, you get in trust. So, so I think we're, we're, we're in a period like that. I, I think the, you know, you talk about cyber and malicious malware attacks, but, you know, we're in a post-Snowden world. I, you know, first thing we have to worry about is how we credibly speak to a world that, you know, that thinks that we, that the NSA is the enemy, and that's going to take a while. It's a very delicate process for our policymakers can take real leadership and, and far-sighted uh, communication with our closest allies to build, again, to build a foundation uh, going forward. I would say just one more thing, um, which is that in this period where we're not going to see for a long while the U.S. send expeditionary armies abroad, um, I, just, I really think we are in a, a post-Iraq post-Afghanistan world, how are we going to project national power? And when I look at, at the government, I see a bunch of agencies that are sort of about that, uh, but not organized for coherent uh, application of, of power. And I think that's like the biggest thing that I wish uh, people at the CSISs of Washington would, would think about. Um, just to, to, to conclude with, with one example, you've got, you got the USIP, wonderful boutique. It doesn't want to do this. You've got USAID. It's a wonderful aid contractor sometimes, but it's not going to do this. You have a conflict and stabilization bureau at the State Department, which is shrinking, last I knew, and mm. it's, it doesn't even dominate the State Department, let alone the interagency process. You want a CIA that would love to get out of the a lot of the covert action business, thank you very much, and go back to collecting foreign intelligence. So who is, how are we going to project power? The only people I hear with a really coherent strategy about this are special forces who came out of this decade with their reputation not diminished, I would say, but, but if anything, enhanced. They have a network, you know, 80 countries around the world, we've trained their special forces, their personal relationships, contacts, ways to move quickly and quietly to deal with problems. And so I think some creative thinking in that space would be very useful. Very good. Mitchell, I, do, I just want to say before you speak that Smart Power is, I think, a CSIS <laughs> branded product, oh, which we are deeply <laughs> proud. Um, but uh, I take your point very much on the sloganeering. It's done well for us, but uh, I take your point. Um, whatever, whatever it takes yes, to get a foundation right. grant. So in, a, in addition to Smart Power being a pillar of the yep. new American foreign policy consensus, what would you add? Well, I, I think I want to um, sort of build on, on David's remarks. Um, if you look at what I think is strategic confusion in the White House, if you add a national mood that's inward looking, if you add a, a complicated, confusing, fast moving world, a lack of resources, what it suggests is that not much is going to happen over the next few years uh, in terms of an activist American foreign policy, especially if the president is going to shy away from doing the inexpensive thing, which is talking about American values. Okay, for whatever reason, that doesn't appear to be in the cards. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, I think it means that um, uh, the world's going to continue to be a dangerous place, uh, that our adversaries will take heart, uh, that our friends will retreat from us uh, if they can, uh, hedge their bets, or seek um, self-help. 
uh, through acquiring more weapons, perhaps uh, starting towards uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, but there's one sort of wild card here, which is that uh, according to most estimates, in the public domain at least, um, sometime in 2014, the administration is going to have to make a decision on Iran, uh, assuming that the, the negotiations don't, don't go as successfully as we all hope they will. And so that's going to be a very interesting moment as to whether the administration, in fact, is going to go against every other trend that's out there in order to use military force uh, because the president has said in Iran with nuclear weapons is unacceptable. Uh, there are so many dangers no matter what he decides in this case. And it's a decision you don't want to wish on any president ever. And you want to try and create more <coughs> options for him. But this may be something that, that is coming down the pike. So I see that uh, over the next couple of years, um, uh, we will be slowing down the engine a little bit. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the rest of the world is going to be standing still. It means that uh, bad things are going to continue to happen around the world, uh, and the United States is not going to be there to, uh, to prevent them and to uh, support our allies in ways that we've done uh, in the past. I just, I, I want to come back to this values point. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, the public's view towards promoting values, but I wanted to highlight a conversation that's been going on inside the administration um, in different fits and starts we've had of this, but it's, at some points it was quite intense ever since September of last year. And I mentioned September of last year because that was the month that all three legs of the proverbial foreign policy stool, diplomacy, defense, and development, all took a very tragic turn and experienced a tragic turn of events. Of course, we're all familiar with what happened in Benghazi, the loss of four Americans on the diplomatic side. On the development side, September of last year was also the month that you'll remember Russia decided to kick AID uh, out, of, out of the country. And September of last year was also uh, the time in which we lost uh, eight, well, six Harriers in Afghanistan, the worst loss of military hardware since the Vietnam War. So we had this moment inside the administration where every major agency, state, DOD, aid, they were suddenly faced with this question about the risks and rewards of promoting US values and policies abroad. And it triggered a lot of very tough debates for the administration, and it will continue to do so for any administration. Do you keep the embassy in Peshawar open despite the risk to US personnel? How does AID promote democracy and good governments in places where their host government is hostile to their mission? And how does the US military continue to ensure that its precious military hardware is protected even in the face of highly sophisticated attacks? And so this has triggered an interesting internal debate that mirrors in some ways the public debate we're seeing on the values piece. But just to be clear, policymakers inside these agencies are also having to grapple again with this risk reward piece of it and how to best promote our policies and values while keeping our personnel and our hardware and our values close at heart and protected and secure at all times. So it's been a really interesting um, set of issues to see from the inside mm -hmm. of the administration. But again, it mirrors some of what's going on mm -hmm. on the outside. Mm -hmm. I think um, we've probably done a pretty good job of describing the problem. I, I think the takeaway, the interesting in the Q&A, the takeaway here is it's not really clear what the major way, pillars are for a US foreign policy consensus. So I certainly invite the questioners to, to raise some issues there. We have mics coming around. Um, and I'll, um, when I call on you, I ask that you give me uh, your name and an affiliation if you have one. So we can start right here in the front. Ah, here we go. Thanks. I'm Chris Nelson, and I write a report almost every day, as Mitchell will tell you, uh, on Asia. And while this has been a fascinating discussion, I'm feeling kind of left out. <laughs> uh, and just you can rebalance. That yes, uh, uh, I, I, I'm a pivot man myself. Uh, for the purposes of the discussion, uh, if we've been sitting here in 1975, we'd be talking about the last helicopter off the embassy, and we'd be going, "Oh my God!" And it would be another, you know, sort of Syria discussion. And yet, look where we are. Um, but what has astonished me is uh, we seem to have this consensus. There is no American foreign policy. There's no success. And Obama doesn't know what he's doing. Wait a minute. China relations? You can argue about this or that. But there's a joint agreement to try to manage them as rational adults, right? 
uh, we are certainly re moving to, to refurbish every alliance we have in Asia, uh, some more successfully than others. We've got a hell of a problem between uh, Korea and Japan, but uh, uh, maybe we need to get involved. Uh, uh, Iran, we've got a tough decision. As Mitchell has written and uh, talked for years, we've still got this North Korea conundrum. So I think we need to play Asia more into this. We need to recognize what successes we are having in Asia. <laughs> Uh, uh, last time I checked, it's, you know, there's more trade, there's more people, there's more everything going on. It ain't all just about Syria, as horrible and, and sad and depressing as that is. Are we going to be talking about Syria 20 years from now, the way we're dealing with now with Vietnam? Or right? I don't think so. So maybe if you have a few minutes, let's remember Asia is still there and U.S.-China relations are, are being managed fairly successfully. Thank you. So is Asia, U.S. policy on Asia, is that a source for potential consensus? Thoughts on the panel? Uh, Sure, Chris. Um, uh, you know, let, let's go back to 1975 when we did start, uh, we retreated from Vietnam, uh, bad things started happening in the region. Uh, Taiwan started getting nuclear weapons, Korea started looking at it, even the Japanese did. Um, and uh, again, that's certainly possible today. Uh, you write on this every day, so you know better than most, is that um, there's been an uneven record over the last five years with Asia. Um, there was this uh, hyper excitement at the beginning, it was going to be our strategic partner. Uh, well, that was soon uh, disabused. Secretary Clinton went to, uh, went to Beijing, first trip, she said she wasn't going to raise human rights at all. Um, the question is, are our relations with our Asian allies better today than they were five years ago? And, um, you know, arguably, are they better with China? Uh, I'm not sure. Are they better with India? I think clearly not. Uh, are they better with the Japanese? Um, again, not sure. Korea, maybe. Uh, Inter-alliance squabbling? Uh, squabbling is not the right word. This is sort of very histor uh, serious uh, differences between South Korea and Japan now are eroding the alliance. So if you look at our position in Asia, uh, you look at where we were, uh, you look at where we are now and where we hope to be in the future, um, do we have the right model in terms of rebalancing to, to Asia? I would argue yes, we do, in part because I think that it started uh, under the Bush administration. Uh, but are we applying the resources to make that a reality? Uh, you know, we're doing a few things. Uh, trade is a separate issue, but this administration was very late to the trade game, as you wrote uh, almost daily, uh, especially in the first term and didn't want to talk about it. So uh, again, uh, it's not clear where the great successes are in Asia. Uh, I suppose Burma uh, may be one. Uh, but again, if you look at the great powers in the world, I, I can make a case uh, that uh, the United States does not have better relations today uh, with the great powers than we did five years ago. We do not have better relations today with our key allies than we did five years ago. And so I, I think that this is, a, this is a, a part of a larger strategic drift by this administration, and uh, Asia is, is a piece of that. Um, I, I think I dissent um, from that critique. Uh, I've said some very critical things about the administration's foreign policy, but I think the um, desire to rebalance uh, toward Asia, uh, although the word pivot, I think everybody would agree now, was uh, mischosen, uh, whoever, whoever picked it or said it. Um, the, the policy was, was basically right. Uh, you know, I, I don't know as much about this region as, as many, I'm sure, in the room, but you know, when the U.S. manages to have pretty good relations with China, Japan, and South Korea, but that's a pretty good policy process. Um, the uh, way in which the U.S. has handled um, the transition in China to uh, Xi Jinping and a new, uh, younger, uh, Central Committee, um, the way the U.S. kept its mouth shut about the Bo Xilai affair and let the Chinese work through what was a very difficult period for them, I think was mature policy making. Um, I think we'd see more, um, you know, uh, texture to the rebalancing idea if we didn't have the sequester preventing um, the kind of rebasing of, of our military assets so that they were more av available for the Pacific. But when I walked through that with uh, people in, in the Navy Department, that's, that's a pretty coherent um, Navy and Air Force idea here. So I, uh, I think 
Syria is going to matter um, now and alas for a while, but that doesn't overshadow um, the, the, the good policy making in, in Asia. I think I'll bet you Vice President Biden will play more of a role going forward in, in the China relationship. He certainly helped Xi Jinping's uh, uh, tra transition process. And, and so I, that's, that's a stabilizer in my mind. So Julie, help us be prospective um, on Asia. Um, it seems to me it's, it has huge trade potential. It um, use of force with the um, important caveat on Korea, use of force at a high level for the US is unlikely in the region, seems like a place where we could have some amount of a bipartisan consensus on where to go. Uh, do, do you agree with that assessment, and what do you think that looks like? I would hope so. I mean, unfortunately, it doesn't get a lot of attention um, in foreign policy circles right now. I feel like the Middle East continues to take the oxygen out of the room, both in debates up on the Hill and across the think tanks here in Washington, although there are obviously people dedicated full time to, to Asia and every think tank uh, around the city. But I, I think this, first of all, I'd like to chip away at a couple myths. I mean, there, because the president had to cancel his trip because of the shutdown, there's a lot, there's a narrative that's floating around and a, a lot of folks have the sense that somehow the administration is gonna be abandoning the rebalancing policy. I don't think there's any truth to that whatsoever. I think you'll see the president return to the region in short order. I know folks are already trying to work out you know, a way in which they can get him across the Pacific. Uh, he's dedicated to it, this policy comes from the top. It did from day one. This is not driven by, you know, bottom up. It's his idea, his agenda, his legacy. But I'd also say it's not a short-term policy. I hope that the next team that comes into the White House will continue to pursue this, much as you pointed out. Uh, the Bush administration had a very aggressive and ambitious Asia policy. The Obama administration has now taken that and tried to d deepen and widen it. It's a multifaceted approach. It appeals to everyone. There's naturally a defense component, but as Secretary Hagel pointed out this morning, it's not driven by defense policy. It has a strong diplomatic piece. It has a strong economic economic piece, and yes, we're still waiting for the results in some of these regions and some, some of these issues that you mentioned, Mitchell, but I think we have seen some really significant changes. I just cite one. In the, in the China relationship, we've been in this cyclical um, habit with the Chinese of, you know, we engage and then we hit a crisis and we turn the lights out. And then we engage again and we hit another crisis, we turn the lights out. We've tried very hard to get past that. And I think the administration has succeeded in keeping the channels of dialogue open at all times, regardless of what was happening, regardless of how tense things Things may have been over Chen or any of the other incidents that we've seen in recent years. And that, to me, is a baby step, but an important sign about the maturing nature of the relationship. And I, again, I'm clear-eyed about the challenges, particularly with India. I think you have a good point there. And there'll be many more challenges ahead in working with the Chinese. But I like the regional approach. I think, again, the multifaceted piece, the long-term view is just about right. And I hope we will see bipartisan and support for that moving forward. Okay, right here. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Christy Kaufman. I'm the executive director of the CODA Support Foundation, which is a nonprofit that strives to bridge the civilian military divide. The panelists mentioned earlier on um, the war weariness that this country is feeling, and I would certainly say, as a military family member for 11 years, marrying my husband just before the war started. I can attest to that. Um, while I think most Americans appreciate the all-volunteer force and what they've done over the past decade or so, we're less than 1% of the population. Can you talk about how the civilian-military divide affects, if it does, and how it might affect uh, our ability to actually come to a national consensus about national security? This is an issue very dear to my heart. I, I'd, I'd you like should, to you should have <laughs> well, no, yeah. I, will, I actually on. will start with David. I'm very interested from your perspective as somebody who talks to people inside the administration, outside the administration, in the military, in uh, the public. What's your sense of the state of civil military affairs and how it affects where we're going in foreign policy? Well, I, I think the, the, our volunteer military has undertaken every challenge that the country uh, asked of it. 
um, over this last uh, decade plus, um, and uh, performed very professionally. Uh, but um, you can see the, the problems with having an all-volunteer force that sometimes seems like a separate part of the country. Um, you know, the, the country, when, when you go to war, the country needs to be all in. And if the country isn't all in, you're going to end up with, with problems. And I can understand why military families would, would feel for all the, you know, the applause when people walk through the airports in uniform that, that, that there is a separation. Many of my friends in the military worry about that, that separation and, and, uh, and, and divergence. And that's one reason why, I, uh, I think, first, the, the most skeptical comments I hear about future use of U.S. military power, the wait a minute comments, come from people in uniform. Mm. And General Dempsey is an obvious example, but there are many, many senior, ex extremely experienced officers, multiple, multiple tours, uh, who would, who would say, say the same thing. And, I think, you know, in the context of our subject today, what, what thoughtful people should think about in this period are what are the other components of national power Absolutely. That, that draw in not just a volunteer military, but the nation as a whole. What are other ways in which uh, people can serve, be active, uh, you know, the tremendous dynamism of our culture, our economy, uh, you know, it's just, it's still like a <laughs> overwhelming force of the world. Um, how should we think about that? How does that fit with ideas about strategy and, and keeping a country secure and maintaining good relations with other countries that, uh, let's face it, resent us a little bit? I'd, I'd just say one quick thing. I, David's absolutely right on all fronts, um, but I'd bring it back inside the government as well. I just encountered personal anecdotes. In it too many civilians working in, on foreign policy in our government of all political stripes, um, from FSOs to political appointees that just do not have the necessary exposure to the military, to the Pentagon, to the culture, to <clears throat> understanding the technology, to the acronyms, to looking at a power, all of it. And it affects how we do business as a unit, as the US government on a day-to-day -day basis. And anything we can do to encourage more interaction and exposure there would be helpful. There's just too many folks you see, both at the White House and State at AID, that don't, quote, cross the river even. So inside the microcosm of the US government, we have a problem. But as you pointed out, there's a bigger problem here across the United States. Yeah, let me just, uh, the only thing I'll add, there's, this is a whole topic unto itself. A uh, panel surely will do w at one point. But I do think it's important to think right now about the budget environment and sequester and the way that's being interpreted by many in the military as a sort of a direct disrespect of what it takes to do what they do um, and what it will mean in terms of breaking what is considered by many to be social compacts in, ter in terms of how the military will have to draw down to meet sequester. Um, so it's a big challenge, I think, and particularly in the coming five years or so as we have huge costs that extend well beyond the conflicts we've been in to take care of our military and their families at the same time that we have this incredible pressure to bring down the budget and very little flexibility in how we do that. So, yes, right over here, please. Bernhard Altesberger, Air Attaché at the German Embassy. Uh, thanks for having me here and invited. Uh, I want to be, to come back to the topic. Uh, can a national security consensus built, uh, and I want to ask you, where do you see the motives at the moment um, to achieve this aim, which is very important, across the aisle, yeah. within the society? Because at the moment, it seems to me, the nation is almost obsessed with two topics. Who is the next presidential uh, candidate? And second, uh, how, um, how to go forward with the Affordable Care Act. And this is a really important topic, how to achieve this national security consens consensus, which is, to my observation, um, not at the, uh, at the platform, which is, can not be observed. Where do you see the motives to achieve that, particularly politically? 
And I would like to make one remark um, to the question before. Me, as a foreign uh, military representative here, I just want to address how I observe to what ex positive extent the military personnel here, even I, are acknowledged at least by the society. This is exceptional. And I want to thank you, uh, the Mer uh, United States, for that. Thank you. So, Mitchell, sure. do you want to speak um, about that? You know, there's an old joke that asks, uh, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> and the answer is uh, only one, but the light bulb really has to want to change. And so uh, <laughs> the, question, the question is, does the political culture in Washington really want to change right now? And it's not clear to me that by itself, if left to its own devices, that it, that it will. It, it seems, in fact, that it's only getting worse. So to ask your question, what would it take to actually change the status quo here, to, to arrest this trend, and perhaps to try to forge a greater consensus? And, and um, I wrote down a couple of things. One is that you could have another tragic event like 9-11, okay, or a direct threat to the United States. One of the reasons why the American people, I think, feel that we can turn inward now, we should turn inward, is because we don't feel any existential threat to our physical security. And, and I think if that were to change, that would change the political dynamic very quickly. Now, we hope that it doesn't. There's some other reasons. If some of the more polarizing and extreme representatives are defeated by the voters, if the voters decide we just don't want this anymore, um, that's possible. Um, if the more polarizing representatives are denied funds by the donors, this is what David mentioned earlier, okay? The money stream dries up. And we've already seen a little bit of that in the last couple of weeks, uh, where some of the, the private groups have pulled back uh, from some of the Tea Party folks. Um, one of my favorites is if you overturn gerrymandered districts. Okay, safe seats, you only have to talk to people who believe what you believe. It's like a self-licking ice cream cone. Okay, it's, it's just, it's, uh, so you never have to reach across the aisle. You don't even have the vocabulary for talking to people who may have different views. You don't have to broaden your appeal to reach out to independents or people who believe differently than you do. So I think those are all possibilities. I think maybe with a little bit more time, if we can take some of the current contentious issues off the table, um, if uh, Obamacare gets worked out one way or the other, okay, off the table, because right now that is a hugely polarizing uh, uh, issue. And again, domestic issues are making foreign policy consensus more difficult. Immigration is another one. Budget and tax reform is a third. Um, believe it or not, maybe having a new president uh, may forge a consensus um, come 2016. Don't know. But again, right now the problem is the domestic issues are bleeding over into the foreign policy issues and making it just much more difficult to achieve uh, any type of consensus on, on these important things. Any other thoughts? Thank you. I'm uh, Robbie Harris, a former naval person. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I think all three panel members uh, referred to a nation that is weary of war. And I'd like to call on the lady's question earlier about the military civilian divide. Uh, everybody talks about the weariness of war, but also folks talk about the military going to war, but the nation went to the mall. Uh, and also drawing on the lady's question, uh, only a very small percentage of this nation has been directly affected by either of the wars. Uh, the military has become insular over the past 20 to 30 years. Uh, the military tends to recruit from its own. Uh, it has indeed become insular. So I guess my question to the three panel members is, help me if you can, help me understand this nation that is weary of war when so few have been affected by the war. Thoughts from, from any of you? Well, I, th I think you're, you're absolutely right. I, and it's, a, it's a very small percentage that have been tangibly affected. But I, it, it's, it's a visible wound that we've all suffered. And, and we, we're, it's, it's 
familiar to us as a nation. I think it's, it's beyond seeing how it's directly impacted the troops, it's how it's affected us as a nation, perceptions about US leadership, skepticism about the utility of military force, concerns about what we're committing to when we get involved. It's been a broader and frankly fairly sophisticated debate out there beyond Washington. Uh, so you're right, there, there are few, very few families that have a son or daughter who have served, uh, perhaps very few families that have direct experience in seeing the impact on troops returning home or knowing someone who's had a loss. Uh, but all that said, I've been pretty impressed with the level of sophistication about the broader use of force in the American toolkit. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, it's been um, a debate that's worth having. And uh, I worry a little bit that it tips the scales too much in one direction. But it's been a very useful, useful debate, I think, for the country to have. Yeah, I think we have to be very clear in our vocabulary. Um, you're absolutely right. Only a small percentage have really made sacrifices, including the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, so I think war weariness is not the precise term. I think what's happened is that the American people have suffered a loss of confidence. And not particularly confidence in the military, but confidence in the decision making that's sending our military overseas. That's right. That, that's really where I think this war, it comes under that heading of war weariness, but that's not really what it is. Is that we're not sure anymore that it's worth the sacrifice that these men and women are making on our behalf. That's the weariness. It's a, it really comes down to a lack of our having confidence that, that not only we're doing the right thing, but we even know what the right thing is in these very complicated situations. And so I think that that, I, I believe that's a more accurate way to portray the mood. Well, let me just raise two things that haven't come up explicitly before that are in addition to these points and, and, and ask David about them. The first is certainly the economic effects that Americans have experienced, um, of which the, you know, the war efforts have contributed. And the second really is the role of media. Um, and we haven't talked at all about sort of the future, how, how, how the future of foreign policy has to account for uh, the incredible flow of information that people receive today. Do you have any thoughts on those or other issues? Well, just related just to briefly, I, I, I think I would have said on this on this question of, of the nation's uh, weariness. Um, you know, if you like to listen to country music, as I do, um, you know, you hear a, a kind of general sense that the elites. There's a wonderful song called "Flyover States." <laughs> I urge you to go listen to. <laughs> um, that the elites have been doing great while the average man and women has been getting pounded economically, sent off these wars that don't make any sense to fight for people who aren't grateful and don't like us anyway. And, and, uh, and, and so I think there's this feeling, as, as Mitchell said, that the, the, the elites have kind of let the country down. And that's part of this anger that's reflected in, I think, a very counterproductive way through the Tea Party. Uh, but it, it's it's out there. This this sense our economy collapsed. But you know those people on Wall Street still seem to be driving awful big cars. Um, on the question of the media's role, I have to be honest and say that the news media increasingly are what I would call a partisan excel accelerator. Um, you know, you t take a small uh, squabble and boy we'll turn it into a you know <laughs> nuclear war uh, if you give us a chance and and I'm not speaking here of, of the Washington Post or the New York Times because I think you know we do still you know we're derided uh, these days as the mainstream media uh, unfortunately the, the part of the news business that's really thriving is the part that tells you um, you know uh, what you think is right the people you think are bad are bad, and here's evidence. And the people you think are heroes are great. And you know that's true on the left, um, increasingly, uh, in blogs and uh, on MSNBC, and it's certainly true the, on the right uh, with Fox News. And they're partisan accelerators, and that is part of our problem. And I have to tell you, it's very hard struggling to do traditional coverage of things in a way that you, is trying to be balanced, which are Editors do try to do, believe it or not. 
um, we fear that there's less of an audience for that. Very good. We have time for two questions. Let me go right here. Uh, Peter Sharfman, Miter Corporation. Uh, I'd like to return back you know, to the original question and suggest that the broad consensus is about much bigger things, or the lack of broad consensus, uh, than uh, was our policy towards Syria in the last three weeks adroit or maladroit? And have we been communicating properly in the last three months with Saudi Arabia? Uh, we had four pillars, I think, of consensus on foreign policy, apart from the basic one that the homeland has to be defended no matter what it takes. We would support our friends if we had allies overseas that relied upon us, that shared our values, we would do what it takes to protect them against external threats. That's been a pillar uh, for decades and remains the cornerstone of our declaratory foreign policy. A second pillar of our foreign policy was to try to promote a world order in which international trade could flourish and in which um, innovation and invention economically could flourish. That's been a pillar for decades. A third one was to prevent, or if not prevent, slow proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Remains a pillar of our existing declaratory policy. The fourth one was to try to promote uh, political, economic, and social change overseas in directions that we thought would make the people overseas better off. And that's where the consensus has obviously collapsed. But the question I would ask is, how strong or how fragile is the consensus on the other three pillars? OK, I'm going to group this with another question, and the, that'll be the last one right behind you. There. Yes, Eric Thompson on State Department. Uh, Mr. Ignatius, you mentioned earlier about, you referenced the uh, Maliki government and also that uh, Al Qaeda was taking over part of a large part of, of, of Iraq right now. How much would you say that is uh, a fallout from Mr. Maliki's own policies there in the country, and what are its implications? It's a good question. I'll, I'll repeat what I uh, wrote last week uh, after his uh, his visit, where he came asking for counterterrorism assistance. I, I noted the irony. This must be the only person in the world who's asking for more <laughs> American surveillance. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's easy to understand why, because he, he does have uh, a growing uh, Al-Qaeda province a problem in the western areas of Iraq. But as you suggest, it's, it's in significant part his own doing. He has been a sectarian leader. He has not given uh, Sunnis uh, in Iraq a feeling that they have uh, a share of the, of, the, of the pie. He let the Sons of Iraq movement that General Petraeus built that was, you know, had basically uh, thrashed al-Qaeda uh, thanks to the tribal leaders, it let it go, didn't pay them, um, a whole series of things. So my own feeling is um, it's in our interest to work with Iraq and other, par other security, prospective security partners to uh, go after Al Qaeda. But that shouldn't be a free ask. You know, the, the, these are, these are uh, special American technologies. And, you know, in a world that <laughs> thinks it doesn't want to, I mean, if, you know, if you want to work with us on problems of mutual security, there are certain expectations that we should bring to the table. And I hope those were made clear to Prime Minister Malachi. Not to say that we should say absolutely not, we refuse, but we should say what you, what you implied. These problems are partly of your making, and if you want to get them under control, you have to govern differently. Julie and Mitchell, thoughts on the pillars for foreign yeah, policy? Yeah, I, I, it's not the list. I think we could, you know, show up in a 
capital city, you know, some city across America and ask folks on the street, do these sound about right to you? And I think you'd get the nods, but it's the two questions that come afterwards. How are you going to do this and at what cost in an era of austerity? So are you going to commit U.S. troops to this? Are there going to be U.S. dollars involved? Are we the only one carrying the load? Is there someone else working with us? Is there a legitimacy piece to this? Do we have the blessing of international institution? Lots of other questions will come with it. So the list itself, I think, stands more or less. And again, you'd get the thumbs up. But particularly on proliferation, well, how are you going to go about it? That's where you're going to get the debate. And I, I, uh, I think that's going to have to be our last word. I want to have you all join me in thanking our excellent panelists today. Thank all of you. Thank you.